when we got to meet them, they took us to the bar and got us very, very drunk uh, on what they called heart starters, which is large gin and tonics. And uh, we, had, we ended up in a sort of rather bleary way, um, thinking they, still thinking they were going to do our play, but in fact they were secretly just testing us out to see if they were, we were material for writing Doctor Who. And they said, we'd like to do it, Doctor Who. I said, yes, yeah, fine, sure. Now, how about these tanks? And then so it went on like that, and they, they, I kept mis, misunderstanding what they were talking about, sort of, uh, uh, you know, and finally then saying, would you like to do a Doctor Who? And said, yes. And then suddenly it came to me, I thought, my God, they've asked if we would like to write a Doctor Who. And for me, that was, that was a big, big thing, because I'd watched it from the very beginning, the first episode in, in 1963. Um, and then it took a whole year for us to be hammered into shape to be able to do Doctor Who. Uh, we wrote in storylines by by the dozen, and they're just going to say, "No, we can't do that. Can't do that. We're not MGM. We can't do that. We can't." Do and I suddenly realised two things: one, that they're a very very low budget show. I thought it was a big budget show, uh, and that that uh, you really have to knuckle down and write it in in the format that it was made in, and that you cannot go outside those boundaries. And that's uh, we were sort of quite naive about that sort of thing, uh, but but there we are. We I then had. Uh, Finally, it was uh, we went from a seven-parter to a six-parter, then to a four-parter, which was uh, put out as Claws of Axos, and um, it's you know it was very quite successful really. The Doctor is the Doctor as always, but I mean there are certain things. I mean, I preferred if if I had to prefer, I'd say Tom was better uh, because he was he had a kind of um, uh, I said, there's a kind of something about him which you knew that he he believed every word whereas uh, I felt um, John Pertry was more of an actor perhaps a bit of a comedian as well and uh, a comedian trying to be serious which uh, which was I mean he was very good I, I, I can't fault it but I mean there's just a, difference, just a slight difference I preferred Tom to write for because you you knew exactly how to say the line and uh, you know and once you got a good story and you got everything working it was a I think all the ones we did with Tom were fantastic. Uh, um, well, there's one particular thing, of course, is, is that we created the little doggy K9, who uh, became a companion, and has you know kept his fame right until the until the present day. And uh, it was amazing to us that they took it on. We didn't know that they would take him on as a constant companion. Um, and we thought it would be, you know, just on the one show. So it was, that was an extra bonus, and it was a, a terrific thing that that uh, that he was accepted, and he was he was you know well thought of by the by the fans. I mean, some of the fans hated him, obviously, um, but it was very handy for the show because it, uh, the uh, the doctor, whoever he might be, had an extra person to use in his sort of armory of of uh, what to do in terrible situations. You got the canine situation as well and uh, the only problem that, that they found was that he was a bit cumbersome and would knock things down and also Tom didn't like him particularly because he had either had to kneel down or lie down to talk to him uh, and he quite often made a few expletives about dog. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a rollicking good series uh, and uh, we're, we're working towards getting a second series together. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, there's a, a different attitude in Australia. Um, we made it in Australia and uh, uh, it, it didn't ha they didn't have the same impetus as, as you'd get here, I think. But nonetheless, I mean, I've heard no really terrible criticisms of it. And, uh, you know, I think it looks good. And of course, K-9 is regenerated so that he can fly, so the actors don't have to lie down and kneel down. And he can come up to their faces and talk to their face and whisk off and, and become a, a real sort of superhero type character. Well, uh, I quite often get asked to do the kind of disc to go with the, the DVD that's coming out, to do the sort of chat thing with, with whoever was the doctor and whoever was companions. And you then have to look, at, look through it about three times before you go to answer the questions. And I was amazed. I wasn't at all embarrassed. And I was actually, well, as I say, amazed at some of the dialogue that, that was there, you know. And I thought, 
God, I mean, there's a Sontaran experiment, and there's just two smaller characters. Uh, but they, they're talking the most incredible philo philosophical stuff, you know, and it's all there, And it, but it all works as well. Uh, that's the interesting thing. Um, we have an airplane going over. <laughs> So, you know, I am not at all, I mean, there's a, obviously there's a few little special effects which look a bit wobbly and uh, some of the, 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 before there was CGI, you had to use colour separation overlay and that was never quite right. You always had a silver line around the character and uh, the backgrounds weren't, weren't this quite tightly done. But on the last one I did, which was um, Garden of Eden, um, no, sorry, uh, Nightmare of Eden, um, they improved it quite some and they, they did this kind of mangled smashed spaceship in in CSO color separation overlay which looked very very good and it was I was very pleased with it and they, they had improved I mean I've had Terence Dix the, the script editor would say that's because of you that is there to, to find a new machine to do what you you suggested them doing. Dave had finished and I thought well that's the last doctor we do and then I was working at the BBC on shoestring and I was in the next door office to the Doctor Who people and they were going around and saying, oh, well, we need a low budget show and I said, oh, I'll do one for you <laughs> and they said, all right then and um, uh, so I did I mean, and, and I made it as low budget because I knew how to do it <laughs> so I could make it really low budget and not use terribly expensive scenes and that sort of thing and, and, um, and uh, the, the, the best thing about it was that I had um, Oh my God, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> the Hitchhiker's Guide Man. Oh, Douglas Adams. Yes. The most important thing about uh, Nightmare of Eden is that uh, Douglas Adams was the script editor and we got on like a house on fire. We did, um, we really worked very hard on the script and, and I think it sort of became very polished and, uh, you know, I'm delighted with it, really. I think it stopped because everybody thought it'd run its course. I mean, you know, uh, the fans were beginning to diminish and the doctors were beginning to get a little tired looking, I thought. And um, so it, it had a sort of rest, but it never, the fan base just kept bubbling along. Uh, and so there was always a pressure, always a pressure to try and bring Doctor Who back. But, but uh, when, I went with my partner Paul Tams with the new canine idea to see the BBC. They, they were so, they said, you know, this is silly. I mean, it's gone. It's finished. It's over, you know. And um, so we had to look elsewhere uh, to try and produce it, and that's how we ended up going to Australia. But suddenly, just as we were about to do our deal in Australia, up over the horizon rides Doctor Who Mark Two. Uh, after seven years of, of not being a uh, and this was because Russell T. Davis was a great Doctor Who fan and he just wanted to bring it back in a different format and he persuaded the BBC that it would be a big thing and it has worked out. It's done brilliantly well. Uh, you know, it, it may be getting a bit long in the tooth now, I think, but uh, I think that, that they're sort of, they understand that and they're doing less shows. They're doing one at Christmas, one at spring, one in autumn, so they one in summer special. Which is which is about right, I think. So it keeps people waiting, but I mean, uh, for the next show and, and builds builds interest and builds sort of um, you know, excitement for, to see what's coming up next. But it it is a long, long saga. Fifty years is a long, long time to go on, and uh, it's amazing. I think it's probably the only only program in, in the world that's done that. I mean, the only other thing I think of is the mouse trap. <laughs> it's run for was it sixty years. Uh, Trevor, who played Shoestring, um, had many layers to him. Uh, he was uh, a possible, had a mental breakdown, and that uh, he didn't know how to, uh, um, how to, what to do in life. He, he, he was kind of at a, a loose end, and uh, he sort of drifted into this business of, of uh, being the private ear, which is then again that was a real hit. In fact, that it was a, a local radio station. And, and it worked perfectly. I mean, it, what a lovely way to get into new jobs is through people doing a phone-in, you know. And, uh, I mean, the, the stories were very good. I mean, as a script editor on it, I mean, I was, I was well, I, I was with Robert Bank Stewart, the producer. Um, we, had, we had a lot of work to do. And, and I think that uh, it shows and that, that the, the scripts are good.
and the second series is even better. Uh, but uh, it, it was a great thing to work on, and, and it, for a short while, was the most watched show in the UK. Bezrak was, um, again, interesting in that he was an island policeman. And uh, so you could involve things in France, you could involve things in England, and, and uh, there's an intriguing kind of hierarchy in, within Jersey itself, uh, which then he could try to, uh, um, he could feel neutral in, in a situation where there was political power pushing one way and his girlfriend pushing the other way, whichever. Um, and uh, again, we've got this fantastic background. I mean, uh, the island is beautiful. Uh, lots of um, situations to arise there, from from holiday making, from you know all that sort of stuff. And people w loved it because it, they'd been there at some time, and they just loved to see it and and get the feel of the place. Then I suddenly got this phone call from uh, Dave Spoxton at um, Ardman, who I knew from the days of when I was at HTV, and I'd, I'd always admired their work. And they said they got this new man, and he'd done a, uh, a cartoon called A Grand Day Out, and they wanted to do another one. And But uh, the producer at, HD, at BBC, who were going to show uh, buy it, uh, said that he might need a bit of help on the writing, and they chose me. Uh, maybe because I was just down the road. <laughs> but uh, but it was fantastic. Um, we I got to know Nick, and... Um, we got on very well, and uh, we have ever since. And, uh, and then we went into doing a film, and we we somehow hammered out the wrong trousers. And I was absolutely amazed at it uh, when I saw the finished thing. It was it was you know, I was, I as I say, amazed. I don't think I could say more than that. I was, you know, and uh, then uh, I didn't even think about prizes or anything like that. Then suddenly, um, they <laughs> said. It's won an Oscar. And I said, oh, what? I was in the. I remember. Uh, so I was in the dentist, and uh, I, just, I still couldn't get it clear in my head. And she said, "What are you doing now?" Da 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 da. And um, I said, "Well, I just wrote this thing, and it's just won an Oscar." And she said, oh, "That's fantastic." And then in the next room, a director that I knew was being treated as well. He said, "Well done, Bob." Well. Done.